So today I'm going to talk to you about diabetes and bone. My disclosures. Okay, so first I want to go over just how big a problem it is actually, um, fractures in diabetic patients, then why diabetic patients are at increased risk for fracture, and then how could we best treat it. So as endocrinologists, we all know very, very well the complications of diabetes, the retinopathy and vasculopathy. But I think in the past decade or so, it's become accepted that the skeleton is also affected in diabetes and that we need to think of the bone as a target organ in diabetes the same way we might think of the kidney or the nerves or the eye. And in fact, even Jocelyn himself, um, way back when, uh, noted that patients with diabetes are at increased risk for having fractures. So the first question we have to ask is just how big a problem is this really uh, for diabetes patients? So thinking first about patients with type 1 diabetes, um, patients with type 1 diabetes are living now much longer than they lived um, maybe, let's say, 70 years ago, um, just because therapies are improved. So they're living now into an older age where we're going to be able to be more worried about their skeletal complications, where in the past it might not have been something we were as concerned about. So it's very clear that patients with type 1 diabetes have an increased risk of fracturing, particularly at the hip. So one uh, meta-analysis showed that there was about a fourfold increased risk in type 1 diabetes patients of having a hip fracture. Uh, and then another uh, bigger study showed that there was almost a six-fold risk as compared to a non-diabetic person for somebody with type 1 diabetes to have a hip fracture. So those are real um, increases. Hi, Gaia. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Uh, and this is looking at uh, data in patients with type 1 diabetes in the dark line in men and in the dotted, uh, in the dark, sorry, this is men and this is women. The dark line is the type 1 diabetics and the dashed line are the non-diabetics. You could see that beginning at age 40, both men and women with type 1 diabetes have an increase in their hip fracture risk. And this same group didn't only look at hip fractures, but they also looked at all types of fractures. And they showed that patients with type 1 diabetes, even starting in childhood, were going to have an increased risk of having fractures everywhere, which kind of makes sense because most people are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes as children, and so it can interfere with bone accrual. So it's very clear and unambiguous that somebody with type 1 diabetes is at increased risk for fracture. But what's a little bit puzzling is that if you look at the bone density of somebody with type 1 diabetes, it's actually not that bad. So for example, in this study, they looked at Z-scores, so how someone with type 1 diabetes compared to someone of the same age and gender. And they saw that at the spine, it was mildly decreased. At the hip, it was mildly decreased. But the authors of the study um, calculated what the theoretical increased fracture risk would be with these Z-scores. So based on a Z-score like that, how much would you think this person would be likely to have a hip fracture? And it was about a 40% increased risk, a 1.4 relative risk. But I just told you from these studies that there could be a four to six-fold increased risk in their hip fracture risk. So it means that the bone density isn't fully capturing whatever it is that's weakening the bone in diabetes. So this is an important concept that the bone density is not telling us the whole story, and I'm going to come back to it. But first, I want to give you a little bit of the fracture epidemiology for type 2 diabetes. So I don't need to tell you that like everybody has type 2 diabetes, and it's only getting worse. Uh, and these are data from NHANES showing that in America, people over age 65, that 25% of people that age have type 2 diabetes. So it's definitely a very serious um, public health problem. And of course, it's people who are over age 65 that we're most worried about having fractures and osteoporosis also. So in terms of what the risk is like for fracturing in type 2 diabetes, um, one meta-analysis showed that there was about a 40% increased risk for a hip fracture. So this is nothing at all like what I told you with type 1, where there was like a six-fold increased risk in hip fracture. But if you think that, you know, one out of 11 people have type 2 diabetes, it certainly is of public health significance. Another study that adjusted for increased body size and bone density showed that there was about a 70% increased risk in hip fracture. And probably the biggest one um, and the most recent one shows that there's about a 30% increased risk in hip fracture in type 2 diabetes. 
And importantly, I just showed you data for hip fracture, but there's really um, increased fracture at all sites. So these are data from the Women's Health Initiative, which you know followed like 90,000 women for seven years. And you could see that um, not only the hip, like we just talked about from the other studies, but that at all these other sites, really except for the forearm, there was an increased fracture risk. So it's not just the hip, but you're also going to worry about fractures at the spine, fractures at the foot, um, so really almost everywhere. Um, and what's very interesting to note is that uh, it seems that the most vulnerable site is that of cortical bone for fracture in patients with diabetes. So although there is some increased risk for trabecular sites like vertebral fractures, it seems that the weight of evidence shows that it's really the cortical bone fracture, so including the hip, because we know the hip um, is composed of an admixture of both cortical and cancellous bone. Uh, but those are, uh, it's really the hip slash cortical sites that we worry about the most. Uh, and we also worry about it most in um, people who are not white. So uh, I think we don't really understand why that is, but if you look at people with diabetes who are white, you could see that there's uh, a 20% increased risk of uh, fracture in a diabetic patient who's white versus um, someone who's white and doesn't have diabetes. But then if you turn to a black population, you could see that the risk goes up about to 87% and a Mexican population, it goes up more than twofold. So if you're worrying about fracture in a patient with diabetes, you're gonna worry a lot more about it in a non-white patient. And we don't really understand why this interaction exists. Um, it's been suggested maybe because people who are black who have diabetes may have had it for longer and it was undiagnosed, and that's a risk factor, the longer duration, I'll show you that in a minute, or maybe, um, people who are non-white are more likely to be on insulin, and insulin use is also a risk factor for fractures in diabetes. But anyway, you're gonna worry about it more in a non-white person. Now, you also might ask a logical question, which is if someone has diabetes and they're more likely to fracture, what if they have pre-diabetes? Does that mean like they're just a little bit more likely to fracture? Like, does it exist on a spectrum? Um, but the answer to that is no, because you could see in this study when they um, compared people with normal glucose tolerance, that those who had impaired glucose tolerance, so pre-diabetes, actually had a decreased risk of fracturing. So there was something protective about it. Um, these are the people who were newly, uh, who were, had undiagnosed diabetes, but on the spot were found to have it. And these are people who had long-term diabetes. So this is an important idea, which is that the longer you have it, the more your fracture risk is. And if you're someone with prediabetes, it might be that the effects of obesity or higher estrogen levels are trumping any effects of um, uh, long-term hyperglycemia. Uh, but I just wanna bring this point home that it's really the people who've had diabetes for 10 years or more who are at increased risk for fractures. And before 10 years, it's not that clear. So this is FRAX data, and you could see major osteoporotic fractures started to pick up after 10 years, um, although hip fracture actually really was higher, even you know just with new onset. Uh, but it's important to note this interaction of duration of diabetes with fracture risk. So it seems that if it's more than 10 years, you're at greater risk. So that was a little um, overview of the epidemiology of um, fractures in patients with diabetes. And now I'm gonna turn more to why we think it would happen. So when somebody has a fracture, there's usually two things that contribute. There's some type of trauma, like a fall, that's usually a precipitant, and there's some type of compromise in their bone strength. So the first thing you might say is, well, maybe it's just the falls. We obviously know that people who have diabetes are just much more likely to fall. They can have retinopathy and not see well and neuropathy. They might have an arrhythmia. They might get hypoglycemic. Um, so people have said maybe there's nothing wrong with their bones. It's just that they're more likely to fall. Um, and there does seem to be a, uh, indeed a strong correlation with falling and with insulin use. Um, and this is just making the side point that it's really patients who are on insulin and fall who are at the greatest risk. So these graphs show that um, people with diabetes um, are more likely to fall, really regardless of whether they're on no medication. This is the likelihood of falling or on orals or on insulin, but it's the people who are on insulin and have diabetes who are 
the most likely to have a hip fracture. So this is another important point, which is that insulin use is associated with a greater likelihood of fracturing. And we don't actually think it's insulin itself, because we always talk about how insulin is anabolic for bone, but rather we think that insulin is probably a surrogate for longer disease duration and more complications. So you're going to be more worried about someone fracturing who's had diabetes for more than 10 years and who's on insulin. But just coming back to the falls story, um, it seems that falls cannot really explain fully why people with diabetes are fracturing because all of these big epidemiologic studies adjusted for falls. And even after adjusting for falls, there was still an independent relationship between having diabetes and fracturing. So the falls might be contributing, but it's not enough to say that that's the whole reason that people with diabetes are fracturing more. So I think falls are maybe part of the story, but not the whole story. So we turn now to other contributors of fracture risk and we think about bone strength. So the best way we clinically measure bone strength is with bone density, of course. Uh, and this is showing that this is a meta-analysis of bone density uh, in patients with type 2 diabetes. And this is like the equivalence line in the middle. And these are the women and these are the men. But basically, the point is to show that the femoral neck bone density is higher in people with type 2 diabetes than in people without type 2 diabetes. So they, on average, they have a femoral neck bone density um, that's about 0.04 grams per centimeter square, higher than normal. So this is a little bit of a paradox because we're saying they're more likely to fracture, but yet they have a higher bone density. And this is similar data looking at the lumbar spine bone density. And again, people with type 2 diabetes have a higher lumbar spine bone density, like about 0.06 grams per centimeter squared. So the question really is, is whether can bone density even predict fractures in somebody who has diabetes? Because we're saying that people with diabetes are having higher bone densities, and yet they're fracturing. So this was looked at in this study. And you could see that it's a plot of the femoral neck bone density t-score here on the x-axis and the hip fracture risk on the y-axis. So this solid line is people without diabetes. And this is, of course, what we know well, which is that as your bone density t-score gets lower, what happens to your fracture risk? It gets higher, right? So we know that, of course. As the T-score gets lower, your fracture risk gets higher. But these are diabetes patients, both with and without insulin. And you could see that the same slope exists so that as their bone density T-score gets lower, their fracture risk gets higher. But you could see that it's um, offset, that it, the curve is shifted over to the right. So that means that bone density can predict fracture risk in someone with diabetes, but that you need to adjust it in your mind. And it's important because someone can have the exact same T-score of minus 2.5, but if they don't have diabetes, let's say they'll have a hip fracture risk of about maybe 15%, but if they do have diabetes with the identical T-score, their hip fracture risk will go up to about 20%. So what this means is that if you're evaluating a patient with diabetes and she has a bone density T-score of minus 2, you need to downgrade it in your mind to a bone density T-score of minus 2.6. So you have to shift it down in your mind because that's going to be the accurate reflection of that patient's uh, fracture risk. So bone density is underestimating their fracture risk, so you have to make that correction in your mind. Um, this is just raising the question about whether diabetes patients have a more rapid rate of bone loss, and it's controversial. Some studies think that they do, and some studies think that they don't. So I'm not going to make a big point of it. So bone density isn't really a, our most reliable test because we have to downgrade it in our mind in a diabetes patient. And what about FRAX? So we're all very familiar with FRAX where we can input all of our clinical risk factors and then um, we can get a probability of how likely the patient is to have a major osteoporotic fracture or a hip fracture. And if you look at FRAX, is there anything for diabetes? No, there's no button to press for diabetes, although um, Type 1 diabetes is supposed to be included in secondary osteoporosis, but there's nothing to click on FRAX if a patient has type 2 diabetes. And what's actually been suggested is that you should, sorry, um, click uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and even though this makes zero sense physiologically why you would do that, um, it's been shown to shake out in the epidemiologic data that it will somehow very crudely be able to adjust your FRAX prediction so that it does take into account 
uh, what the fracture risk would be like. Because if you don't make the adjustment, FRAX is also going to underestimate the fracture risk. So you would get somebody's FRAX score in diabetes, and you would think that they're more protected than they actually are, unless you somehow tweak FRAX. Otherwise, your FRAX is going to underestimate their risk the same way the bone density does. So there's actually a few ways to tweak it. The first way is what I just said, that you can click rheumatoid arthritis in a patient with type 2 diabetes, and that'll give you a more accurate measure. Okay. Um, the other thing you can do is you can actually incorporate in trabecular bone score. Can I ask something real quick? Yeah. Which T-score do you use, the, the normal or the 0.6 added? The normal one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so do you, are you able to obtain trabecular bone score in your bone density units? No? Okay. So, um, yeah, you need to have the software for it. Um, but what trabecular bone score TBS is, it's a way of using the picture of the spine DEXA image to see how homogeneous the bone is. Um, and more homogeneous is good, and that means that you have a better bone microarchitecture. And on the other hand, if it's more heterogeneous, it's bad, and that means that your trabecular microarchitecture is worse. So there actually is a little thing on FRAX where you can plug in the TBS, and it'll adjust your FRAX score for TBS. And that's probably important because TBS has been shown to be a very good predictor of fracture risk in women with diabetes. Um, so women with diabetes who had normal lumbar spine bone density scores um, and had fractures, it was shown that the TBS was a much more uh, accurate predictor of who was likely to fracture than um, their bone density score was. So I think nobody really knows what TBS is actually capturing, but it seems that it's somehow crudely showing something that's off about the microarchitecture that's not fully picked up in the bone density. So that's way number two, that you can tweak FRAX. Way number one is to click on rheumatoid arthritis, and way number two is to plug in your TBS. Or the third thing is you can decrease the T-score, like I said, by 0 0.5 or 0 0.6. So I'm just going to give you an example of a case here where you make these adjustments. So this is a 65-year-old obese woman with a BMI of 30.5 who has type 2 diabetes. She's had a prior fracture. She has a femoral neck T-score of minus two and a lumbar spine TBS of 1.16. So if you just plug in her FRAX calculations, just regular without making any adjustments, you would get her 10-year risk of having a major osteoporotic fracture being 17% and her risk of a hip fracture at 2.6%. So would you treat based on these cutoffs? No, right, because you're, the normal cutoff is supposed to be that it has to be 20% or greater, uh, 20 or greater for this, or 3 or greater for the hip fracture. Okay, so you wouldn't treat someone like this. But then if you instead clicked on rheumatoid arthritis when you were doing her fracs, it would go up so that her major osteoporotic fracture would cross the threshold, as would her hip fracture risk. If instead of that you did your TBS adjustment, so it would also go up and meet the treatment threshold, um, or if you decrease her T-score, so you should use the decreased T-score, um, I'm sorry, it would also go up. So you could do any of those three adjustments, um, and so plugging altered variables into FRAX, and that would give you a more accurate assessment and lead you to consider treatment for this patient. In this patient in particular, isn't the fact that she had a prior, if we say a prior fragility fracture, even a T-score and femoral neck of like minus, too. I guess I'd be curious what sort of fracture you meant to be in this hypothetical case. Right. Because that would supersede like the fracture. Right, but that's the thing about fracs, that it's um, it's very dichotomous and very crude, so you can't put in all these subtle things, but if you just checked off prior fracture, which is what you can do in fracs, you would get these numbers in the first line. But you're right, if someone told you that she had a vertebral compression fracture, that's someone who really automatically has osteoporosis anyway. Yes, because we always talk about that that sort of chunks it, like that was Dr. Cosman. Right, but maybe she had, you know, an ankle fracture or something. So I think we, from FRAX you can't specify that. And that's actually an important point because, so all of these things don't really capture the subtleties of a patient. So, you know, you can't really capture here, um, like does your diabetic patient have it for more than 10 years or, is the patient on insulin, you know, but that's kind of how it is with FRAX, like you just have yes, no for steroids, you know, not how 
long they've been on it or how much. And it's really meant to be used for clinicians as kind of a very rough estimate to give them some guidance um, for making clinical decisions. So this is just a way to help refine it when you're seeing someone with diabetes. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, move away from bone density and fracs and how we use those to predict fracture risk in diabetes to more um, things that fall under the rubric of bone quality, I guess we would say. So the first thing is we can look more uh, comprehensively at bone microarchitecture. So we have the high resolution peripheral quantitative computed tomography machine and you've probably heard about it while you've been here. Um, but it gives you a very detailed picture of the bone. So it's almost like doing a bone biopsy without doing a bone biopsy. It's able to give you resolution down to 60 microns, which is really tiny, and it's able to separate out the cortical bone here from the trabecular bone here. So you could see what's going on in the different bone compartments. And what's been shown in a number of studies in patients with um, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes is that there's more holes in the cortical bone. So it's called cortical porosity. So normally, cortical bone is a, like a solid outer a hollow shell, like in your arms and legs. And the hip is made up of that 50% also. Um, and having these microscopic holes called cortical pores can really weaken the bone, but you totally would not see that on bone density because it's much too subtle a deficit for the bone density to be able to pick up. And in this study where they had women with and without type 2 diabetes and with and without fractures, they saw that in the diabetic women who had fractures, they had a lot more of these holes in the cortical part of their bone. They had a lot more cortical porosity. So this is the radius and the tibia where we do the HRP QCT. And you could see without any history of fracture, the cortical bone on cross section didn't look too bad. But if you look at the cortical bone here in the type two diabetic women who had fractured, you could see it looks like, like moth eaten or holy bone, like full of holes. So you could you know, just see that looking at it, that there's more cortical bone, cortical porosity. So this is a little bit of a dramatic example. But um, it's been suggested that maybe this is something that's subtly wrong with um, type 2 diabetic bone. You would never pick it up on their bone density, but it might be maybe making them vulnerable towards having a fracture. And this was recently, that was a very tiny study, but they looked recently in the Framingham cohort. So this was a much bigger study. And they saw the same idea that cortical porosity was increased and also cortical volumetric bone density was lower. So suggesting that there's something wrong with the cortical bone in patients with type 2 diabetes. And it's not really clear why that might be, but it might be that vasculature is affected in the bone. So the same way vasculature is affected throughout the body when you have diabetes, like you have increased vascular calcification and impaired endothelial mediated vasodilatation, uh, the bone gets a lot of blood. It gets 10% of our cardiac output. So maybe the same way microvasculature changes happen like in your eye and in your kidney when you have diabetes, maybe they happen in the bone also. And maybe that's what's leading to the cortical porosity. And the reason that we think that is because in some of these studies, they actually looked at patients who had microvascular disease, like retinopathy or nephropathy, and who didn't. And it was only those who had microvascular disease who had these bad things in their cortical bone. So it seemed that maybe having a compromise in your circulation was associated with having increased cortical porosity. So that was shown here in type 2 diabetes patients and then these authors also looked in type 1 diabetes patients and again saw that those with the microvascular disease had the cortical compromise. And the, peop the diabetics without microvascular disease, their cortical bone was totally fine. It was just like healthy non-diabetic people. So that made them think that it was really something in the circulation. Um, and in type 1, they actually also have trabecular deficits. It's not just the cortical deficits. So both type 1 and type 2 have the cortical porosity, but type 1 also have a a deficit in trabecular bone, and these are associated with compromised microvasculature. And this is just to suggest that um, there's some thought that it might matter what layer of the cortical bone it's in, and that um, the, the outer layer of the cortical bone might be the most vulnerable to having microvasculature insults. So maybe it might be that it particularly happens there anatomically. <laughs> 
But before I leave this cortical porosity hypothesis, I have to say that I think it's not really clear that that's true. So there's been a, a big recent study that actually showed that people with type 2 diabetes had less cortical pores. So instead of having more of these holes in their bone, they actually had less. And it's hard to reconcile why would that data be different. But in this most recent study, they did the measurements a little bit higher up on the radius and the tibia. And it's actually thought that those are more precise because you have more cortical bone a little bit higher up. So it's probably a more accurate location to measure it. So I think we don't know for sure what the answer is. But I think um, you can't say for sure that cortical porosity is one of the causes of it. I have to say in our own cohort here, we've never found that cortical porosity actually seems to be present um, in our type 2 diabetes patients. So I think the jury is still out on just how much of a mechanism this is. So I'm going to leave that at that. OK. But the other thing that's been found that's um, different about diabetic bone is that it seems to be more vulnerable to microindentation. So are people here familiar with microindentation? Um, OK, so this is a very novel research tool where you actually um, take a tiny probe and you indent it into the anterior tibia, like right over here. Um, and the idea is that the probe is hooked up to a computer. And if it sinks in just a tiny bit more, like a microscopic amount, that means that the material of the bone is weaker because it allowed the probe to sink in a little bit more. And the bone is graded as having a lower bone material strength. If the bone doesn't let the probe sink in, then it means that the bone material quality is stronger because it, was, it didn't allow the probe to sink in more. So I'm going to talk about this in a little more detail. So um, the way you do it is you use a tool called the osteoprobe, and you do numb up the surface of the leg here. It sounds a lot worse than it is. You just put some lidocaine, and then you hold it. It's a little bit, um, it looks like, like a mini flashlight or even like a, like a pocket-sized device. I'll show you a picture. And um, you press down, and it releases a fixed force. So that's very important, because obviously, if you push harder, the probe will sink in more. But what you do is you activate it, and then it pushes in with a fixed amount of force. It's 40 newtons. Um, and then it'll sink in, and it's hooked up to a transducer that's able to calculate what's called the BMSI, the bone material strength. And you do it, you take like actually 10 measures, so you get a good sampling of it. Um, so this is actually me doing it on one of our endocrine fellows <laughs> who volunteered. Um, so you could see this; these are his feet here. And um, this is the spot here. And you hold it in a perpendicular way. And you push down the outside. And then the probe will sink in with this fixed force. But it's hooked up. You can't really see the laptop here. Um, but it'll measure just how deep the probe sank in response to the fixed amount of force that went in. Uh, and then it'll give you a number. It takes the average of the 10 numbers. You also have to do it in a reference block. So you take it out of the patient's leg and then do it 10 times on a plastic material. So that gives you kind of the denominator. It calibrates it. And then you get a number um, as to whether it's uh, 73 is considered normal. So whether it's low or normal or high. And the lower it is, the worse the bone material strength is. So the reason why this is cool is because DEXA and HRPQCT, they can't measure the material at all. So they can measure the structure, but they're not getting at what the bone is composed of. So for example, you could have two buildings that have the exact same structure, but one is made of wood and one is made of cement. And they're obviously, even though they are in the same shape, the material of one is going to be different than the material of the other. So there really isn't any tool um, that can measure the material in a person. You could take a bone biopsy and like do tests to smush it and see what the quality is, but this is a way of measuring it in a person. So is it really reflecting something important? Well, there are cadaver data that show that the better the bone material strength, the better the bending strength. That's like a mechanical property of how much something can sustain before it collapses. So it does seem to be valid biomechanically. And even more important, there's a recent study that showed that women who had worse bone material strength by this test were more likely to go on to have fractures at their radius. And um, it was almost statistically significant that they were likely to go on to have fractures at their hip. So that's important because you, if you're using this tool, you want to know that it's really going to be predictive and actually be showing you something. 
the people who make it are trying to get FDA approval for it um, to be used in patients like diabetes or maybe patients with glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis, situations where the bone density isn't telling you the whole story and you think there's something off about the bone material strength. And these data are reassuring because they do seem to indicate that this measure maybe is predicting something about the bone. So it's really giving you uh, a different sense than just the bone density can give you because it's telling you something about the material of the cortical bone. It's cortical because you're doing it in the anterior tibia, so that's a cortical bone site. So um, investigators uh, at the Mayo Clinic had the idea of looking in people who had diabetes and seeing, well, even though these people have amazing bone densities, maybe there's something wrong and maybe the probe is able to sink in deeper in these people. And indeed, that's what they found, that in women who had uh, diabetes, that even though their bone densities were exactly the same as the non-diabetic women, the probe sank deeper in those women. So that seemed to say that, yes, their bone densities were normal, but there was something compromised about their bone material that wasn't picked up on the bone density. And what was really interesting was that they saw that the worse their hemoglobin A1C had been over the past 10 years, the worse the bone material strength was. So suggesting that there's something about the glycemic control that makes the material more compromised. So we replicated those data here and again showed that in women with type 2 diabetes as compared to controls, even though their bone densities were the same, their bone material strength was worse. And we also showed that the longer you had diabetes, the worse your bone material strength was. So it seems pretty clear, and there's been another bigger study that's also confirmed this, yeah, since then, this one. But then the question is, so what would be wrong? Why, why is that happening? Why is their material weak so that the probe can sink in more? So like, in other words, what's causing that to happen? Um, and the leading idea seems to be that um, there's an increase in advanced glycation end products. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but advanced glycation end products are like a bad chemical thing that develops um, if a protein is exposed to a sugar for too long. So for example, if you have um, the protein in collagen that's exposed to lots of sugars floating around, a chemical reaction happens that at first it's reversible, but then it becomes irreversible, and these advanced glycation end products are called AGEs build up. The most famous one is pentosidine. And the way you can measure them is that they'll fluoresce. So they'll, they can build up in collagen in the skin or in the bone when the protein in the collagen has been exposed to sugar uh, for too long. And so this, for example, is how AGEs can develop in food. Um, it's known that if you use very rapid dry heat, you'll um, stimulate uh, the deposition of AGEs to a much greater extent than slow um, wet heat. So kind of like the same thing, I guess, happens when you get AGEs just with aging, but they develop to a much greater and faster extent with diabetes. Um, and it's called a non-enzymatic reaction, which basically means that it's forming these bad kind of crosslinks. So we're used to talking about good crosslinks in bone, like serum ct peptide is a good crosslink that gives the collagen fibrils more strength from bonding with each other. But these are a bad type of crosslink that actually make the collagen fibrils um, weaker because it makes them more stiff and less able to be flexible and deform. And I'll show you some pictures of that. And they're also bad because when you have these um, AGEs building up in your collagen, the osteoblasts and osteoclasts aren't able to do bone formation and bone resorption. So the bone goes into this very low turnover state because the osteoblasts and osteoclasts can't really attach well to this defective collagen matrix. Uh, and we know from animal models that when AGEs build up that the bone becomes weaker even though the bone density looks exactly the same. So that might be an important clue in patients with diabetes that their bone density looks the same, but yet um, their bone strength is becoming weaker. And this is showing that these are in rats with diabetes and normal rats, so you could see the pentosidine, that's this famous type of AGE, is higher, and the higher the pentosidine was, the worse all their mechanical properties were. If they tried to break the bone, if they had more of this pentosidine AGE, it was more likely to break, and we showed this also in mice. So the more it's glycated, the worse the mechanics of the bone are. And actually in diabetic patients, you can measure this in their urine. If they have more pentosidine or more AGE, they'll be more likely to fracture, regardless of what their bone density is. Um, 
So we wanted to look at this more, but it's very tricky because there are no real good blood tests for AGEs. So we had this idea that maybe the more AGEs the people had, the worse their bone material is. And we thought maybe this was the explanation for the probe sinking in more because there was more glycation building up in their bone. But we really didn't know how to measure it because there's no real good blood test that's reliable, let's say for pentosidine, this famous AGE, or another one called CML. So we had this idea that since the AGEs fluoresce, if you shine a light on them, that we could look in the skin as a surrogate for bone because skin collagen is mostly type 1 collagen and bone collagen is mostly type 1 collagen, that we could use this type of tool that um, actually shines a light uh, uh, on the patient's arm and that excites the AGEs. And if there's a high amount of AGEs, they emit back uh, a spectrum that the machine picks up by a spectrometer and that it'll read it out as a high AGE level. So this was a way for us to get an indirect assessment of the AGEs in the bone, because we were measuring the AGEs in the skin. And there are actually cadaver studies that show that AGEs in bone and skin correlate. So this is kind of the measurement that you get. Um, so this is age here on the x-axis, because everyone's AGEs go up with aging, even if you're not a diabetic. Um, so for this woman who I guess was 59, um, so if she was at the average for her age, um, I guess her, her skin autofluorescence, which is the skin measure, should have been like 2.4. Um, but you could see here she was higher than she should be for her age, and her skin autofluorescence was 2.7, which means she has a lot of AGEs that built up in her skin. Um, and uh, that kind of would be supportive of the fact that she just probably has AGEs building up in her bone also. Um, so this is kind of explaining that we use this skin autofluorescence measurement as a surrogate. And our hypothesis was borne out because we saw that the people who had the worst bone material strength were those who had this highest skin AGE level. So that seemed to me, if you had more AGEs building up in your bone, it was most likely to have this compromise in uh, the bone material. And after we finished our study, there was a cadaver study in 28 women where they actually looked directly in the bone biopsies. They didn't do like us in the skin, which was just a surrogate, but they saw the more AGEs in the bone, the worse the bone mechanical properties were. And it's thought just like on a molecular level that when you have high AGEs building up, what happens is that um, normally water is like intercalated in these collagen fibrils, but when you have so many AGEs, not enough water is able to bind, so the collagen actually gets dehydrated, and normally the fibrils can slide nicely back and forth, but here they're not able to, so the collagen actually becomes more brittle and stiff, and it actually loses what's called toughness. So toughness is a mechanical term that means um, how much something is able to deform before it fractures. So it's actually good to be tough because um, if a force is applied, then you could deform and absorb it. So for example, a rubber band is very tough because you can stretch it and it'll deform and it won't break. But glass is the opposite, it's very brittle. You can't really apply any force to it without it shattering. So all these AGEs, what they're doing is making the collagen more dehydrated and less tough and more brittle. And we think that that's probably why it's reducing the bone material strength. Okay, so um, the other points just to make are, so aside from what I told you about maybe cortical porosity and these AGEs um, as another uh, cause, is that bone turnover is very low. And this might be because the AGEs impair the osteoblasts and osteoclasts, but there's been um, many, many studies where markers of bone turnover are low. Um, and it seems it's probably especially markers of bone formation. We're not sure as much markers of bone resorption because the CTX is gonna be low in these patients because remember, there's less of the good, normal, enzymatic CTX crosslinks because there's more of these bad, non-enzymatic AGE crosslinks. So if somebody has a low CTX, we don't really know if it means they actually have decreased resorption or do they just have less CTX around because they have a lot of AGEs. Um, and this is just to show you from some bone biopsies that we did. So you guys probably learned about tetracycline double labeling where it, you know, it's taken up by the actively forming bone and it's like rings on a tree. So you could see that in the control, there was nice uptick of the label, but in our diabetic patients, there was almost no uptick of the label. And that's because bone remodeling is very low and it's especially bone formation that's very low in patients with diabetes. Mm -hmm.
So if you think about everything I've been yammering on about, it's kind of weird because I'm telling you that these patients are fracturing more, but yet they have really high bone densities and really low bone turnover. And that's really the opposite of the risk factors we think about in regular osteoporosis, right? Because someone with regular osteoporosis, they're gonna have a low bone density and that'll increase their risk for fracturing and a high bone turnover and that'll increase their risk. But here I'm saying with diabetes, it's the opposite. They have a high bone density and low bone turnover and yet they're at increased risk for fracturing. So it's kind of a paradoxical situation and it's very hard to put all this data together. And one possible way you could think about it is that, so if somebody has type two diabetes, they'll have an increased level of advanced glycation end products. At the same time, they have a decrease in their bone turnover. Now, so this causes a vicious cycle because if you have more AGEs, you're gonna have less bone turnover because the osteoblast and osteoclast can't attach. But then when you have less turnover, the AGEs build up even more. So they're kind of perpetuating each other. The AGEs we think are gonna impair the bone material strength by making the collagen less tough and less able to deform. At the same time, we think maybe there's an increase in cortical porosity, and again, maybe this is because of microvasculature changes in the bone. And this might also lead to a compromise in bone material strength, and together these will lead to an increase in fracture risk. So this is all hypothetical, and we don't know. You know for sure these are hypotheses that need to be proven, but this is kind of, I think, where the field is at right now. Uh, I just wanted to make the additional point that in type 1 diabetes, in addition to all the things I just talked to you about, you also have to remember that low IGF-1 also will um, prevent uh, the, uh, uh, the normal anabolic effect on osteoblasts, and we think that that's part of what contributes to poor bone strength in type 1 diabetes. Okay, so now I'm just gonna shift a tiny bit and make the point that um, if somebody has a fracture who has diabetes, they're gonna do much worse than someone who has a fracture who doesn't have diabetes, which kind of makes sense. But their glycemic control will be worse and they're gonna have more morbidity and more mortality after. So someone with type one diabetes who's in the hospital for a fracture is two times more likely to die while in the hospital than someone who's there uh, in the hospital for a fracture without type one diabetes. And someone with any type of diabetes for the year following a fracture in the black lines is gonna be more likely to die, except for with the spine fracture at a very old age. But in general, um, they'll be more likely to die if they have diabetes within a year of their fracture. So you really wanna prevent a fracture from happening in a diabetic person even more than in a non-diabetic person. And separate from dying, they're more likely to get all these um, complications, which really makes sense, like UTIs and sepsis. I'm gonna to touch very briefly on um, bone and anti-diabetes medicines. So people wonder what diabetes medicines are good for bone or bad for bone or neutral for bone. Um, we did talk about how insulin increases fracture risk, but remember, it's probably not the insulin itself per se, but more that insulin is a proxy for a longer disease duration and more complications. The other important ones to talk about are the TZDs and the SGLT2 inhibitor. So I'm just gonna talk very briefly about those because they both probably increase fracture risk. So the TZDs it was first found in this big ADOPT study, which was comparing ROSI versus metformin versus gliburide and how well each of those individually would control glycemia. It just came out as an AE, as an adverse event, that women who were on ROSI glitazone were having more fractures in their arms. So that was the first time this was noticed, and it was only in women, and it was really only in the limb fractures, but that first called attention to that. And since then, there's been a lot more data that does confirm that um, women who are on rosy glitazone or pioglitazone, so it's a class effect, and all the TZDs um, do seem to have an increased fracture risk. And I think we don't really know why it's in women and not men, although there are some data to suggest that it might be a problem in men also. And the mechanism is thought to be that when you have a pluripotent mesenchymal stem cell, it can grow up to become either an osteoblast or an adipocyte. Um, but in the presence of TZDs, that's going to block the RUNCs2 that would send it to be an osteoblast and instead promote the P par gamma. So this cell is going to be shunted to grow up to be more likely to be a fat cell than to be a bone cell. And it's thought that that's probably the mechanism of why TZDs um, make the bone weaker. In terms of DPP-41 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, it seems that they're neutral on bone, so they're not really um, beneficial or harmful. 
but the SGLT2 inhibitors do seem to be harmful to bone. So we know that these um, work by affecting the kidney, and there are now uh, our data to show that canagliflozin is associated with both a decrease in hip bone density and an increase in fractures. It's not really clear why it is. Patients on these drugs lose weight, so it's thought it might be related to that. They also have um, intravascular volume depletion, so maybe they're more likely to fall. Um, they also can develop a secondary hyperpara um, and changes in their phosphate levels. I think nobody is sure yet what the mechanism is. I think it's also not clear if it's a class effect or just specific to the canna. Um, but you probably don't want to use the, this medication in uh, a patient at high risk for fracture. And the ADA actually does recommend now that you should use TZDs and SGLT2 inhibitors um, very carefully if you're taking care of a patient who's at high risk for fracture. Okay, and the last section just is to end with talking about treatment. So how will we treat someone with diabetes? Do we treat them just like a regular osteoporosis patient? So the first thing you might just say, well, if you make their glucose control better, is that going to make their bones better? Which seems to make sense if we're saying that hyperglycemia is making their bones worse. So could that be enough of a treatment for them? So this was looked at indirectly in the ACCORD study. You guys probably know the ACCORD study. So the idea behind that was to compare standard control of glycemia versus intensive control. Um, and the standard control group had A1Cs of about 7.5%, and the intensive control group had A1Cs about 1% lower, about 6.5%. And the idea was cardiovascular outcomes, but you guys probably know that the study was negative, and it didn't show that intensive control was better for cardiovascular outcomes. But these investigators said, oh, well, let's look and see, did the people with intensive control have less fractures? And in a way, the study was disappointing because there was no difference and fractures if you had intensive control versus regular control. On the other hand, you could interpret it to say, well, maybe the intensive control, you might have even expected more fractures because if there was more hy hypoglycemia, they might have been more likely to fall and to fracture. But I think this study isn't the final word. First of all, it was only um, about four years on average that they followed the patients for the bone outcome, so it might not have been long enough. Also, many of these patients were on TZDs. At the time this study was done, it was still very common to use that, so that might have been confounding the results. And then most important, the standard group had an A1C that wasn't that bad. It was 7.5%. And we actually know from um, epidemiologic studies that the fracture risk only really starts once your A1C is 8.5% or higher. So with an a A1C that's 8.8% 8 8 or lower, you don't really need to worry that much about fracture risk in your patients. Um, to really see the risk, their A1C has to cross that threshold of 8% or 8.5%. And in the ACCORD study, it didn't. The standard group was at 7.5%. Okay, finally, so should we use our regular drugs? Should we put patients with diabetes on alendronate or on denosumab the same way we would put a non-diabetes patient? I think nobody really knows the answers, but I'll review with you the data that we have. So um, first of all, this is just to tell you that someone who has diabetes and osteoporosis is gonna be much less likely to be treated for their osteoporosis than someone who does not have diabetes, even though they might have other risk factors like being older or being on steroids or having had a prior fracture. Um, there's kind of a bias not to put someone who has diabetes um, on an osteoporosis medication. And on the one hand, this might make sense because we said that these diabetes patients have very low bone remodeling, so why would you want to give them a bisphosphonate? You're going to make the bone remodeling even lower. Um, on the other hand, we did see that the bone density can predict the fracture risk in diabetes. It's just that, remember, this sh curve was shifted over to the right. But still, if somebody's bone density can be improved with the bisphosphonate, they would shift to a better fracture risk. So that maybe argues to treat it. And then we can also extrapolate from glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis, where that's a state of low bone remodeling, but we know if we give those patients bisphosphonates, it does help to decrease their fracture risk. So maybe it would work here also to give these diabetic low bone remodeling patients bisphosphonates. So the data that we have are limited, but this was the FIT study where patients were randomized to alendronate or placebo for three years. Uh, and this shows that bone density improvement in the 
pe women who got who were diabetic who were in the alendronate group was just as good as the women who were in the alendronate group who were non-diabetic. So it's not amazing data because it's not fracture data and it's a post hoc analysis, but it does show that if a diabetic woman was assigned to alendronate, she had the same increase in her spine and her hip bone density as a non-diabetic woman who was assigned to alendronate. So that's reassuring. Uh, and then there's uh, a bunch of observational data where it seems that patients who were on bisphosphonates and raloxifene um, had the same type of reduction in fractures as you would see in a non-diabetic patient who was on bisphosphonates or raloxifene. So this isn't randomized controlled data, but it's observational data that seems to suggest that both bisphosphonates and raloxifene are equally effective at reducing fractures in diabetic patients as in non-diabetic patients. And this is data that was only presented as an abstract, but it's from um, the FIT, which was the alendronate study, and the Horizon, which was the zoledronic acid study. And it here is looking at fractures. I showed you at first the bone density data from FIT. But it seems to suggest that both with spine fractures, that the diabetic patients had a very similar risk reduction as the non-diabetic patients. With non-vertebral, um, maybe it wasn't quite as good, but there was also a reduction in non-vertebral fractures with patients treated with um, either alendronate or reclast uh, in terms of their fracture risk. So this hasn't been published yet, but it does seem to suggest, again, it's not a prospective RCT, but looking back at the data that are available, that diabetic patients had the same reduction in their fracture risk in this study as the non-diabetic patients. Uh, what about PTH? That makes sense to be an appealing um, agent because I told you that diabetic patients have very low bone formation. So giving them a drug that would stimulate bone formation and maybe um, wake up the osteoblasts and have the AGEs be removed um, does seem logically to be very appealing. Uh, and the only data that we have is just a post hoc analysis from an observational study. So this just came from some doctors' clinics where they um, just looked back in the charts of patients who had diabetes who got um, teriparatide, and it did seem to show a reduction in non-vertebral fracture and an increase in bone density and decrease in back pain. So again, it's not an RCT, but it's suggestive that maybe Forteo would work in a diabetic patient with osteoporosis. So there are no RCTs to date that are available. Um, it seems from what we can extrapolate that the bisphosphonates, raloxifene, and teriparatide from these post hoc or observational studies seem to be as good in diabetic patients. Um, we don't know anything about denosumab, but we're actually starting an RCT here to look at denosumab in women with type 2 diabetes. Uh, and then it's just important to make the point that you do need to think more about osteonecrosis of the jaw and atypical femoral fractures in diabetic patients who you're giving these medicines to, because even though we know these are extremely rare phenomena, the data do seem to suggest that when they happen, there is a slightly increased chance of these complications happening in a person who has diabetes. So um, to summarize everything, fracture risk is increased in type 1 and type 2 diabetes, more so in type 1 diabetes. Bone density is lower in type 1 diabetes, although it's a modest decrease in bone density that doesn't fully explain the increased fracture risk. But bone density is really normal or even increased in type 2 diabetes. The important risk factors if you're seeing someone with diabetes is how long they've had it for. So is it more than 10 years? Are they on insulin? They'll be more at increased risk. Do they have complications? And just how bad is their glycemic control? So if their A1C is higher than 8%, you're going to start to be more concerned about it. You can use FRACs with those adjustments we talked about, like putting in RA or using the TBS adjustment or using a downgraded bone density T-score. We think microarchitecture might be abnormal with the cortical porosity. Um, the microindentation with the probe sinking does seem to be abnormal. And some of these changes might be due to alterations in the microvasculature, accumulation of AGEs, and a state of low bone formation. If someone has a fracture with diabetes, it's worse. And basically, right now, you're supposed to just use the standard guidelines for fracture prevention. There isn't anything special that you're supposed to do different. Uh, we think the anti-resorptive therapies do work. So I think based on what we know, you can feel comfortable using these in your diabetes patients. Um, so that's it. That's the whole spiel on uh, diabetes. So any questions?
so yeah, we're looking here. Um, we're doing an RCT to see if denosumab works just as well in diabetic patients as in non-diabetic patients. Um, and we're also looking to see if a therapy that blocks AGE accumulation um, works in women who have type 2 diabetes. Maybe their AGEs will decrease and maybe their microindentation will stabilize or improve. So their bone material strength will hopefully improve. What do you use to decrease the AGEs? Different things have been proposed. What we're using in our study is a metabolite of vitamin B6, which has been shown in preclinical studies in animals um, to block AGE accumulation. So we're randomizing women to the B6 or to placebo and seeing what their microindentation, what their bone material strength is at the beginning, and then seeing after a year if it's better after being on the B6. So I feel like any strategy to maybe not. Um, overly suppress the osteoclast with an awesome app in these patients? Yes, that is true. So y you do wonder, do you want to use something like denosumab? That's what you're saying, because you would suppress right. bone remodeling further. Right, I think we don't know. You know, again, the argument for that would be that in GIO, where bone remodeling is also low, it seems that suppressing it even more is good. But right, you would worry about the bone quality. The idea with denosumab is also that it's been shown in regular osteoporosis to reduce cortical porosity. And if we do think that that's one of the mechanisms in diabetes, so maybe it would be helpful because if there is indeed increased cortical porosity in diabetes, then maybe denosumab would be reversing that. Um, so, but you're right, I think there is a question about making bone remodeling lower in an already low state, that's true. Well, you said CTX levels in diabetes may be underestimated mm -hmm. because of the advanced medication products that they may Exactly. Be so, adequate. exactly. Does that make sense? Yeah, because yeah, you have these collagen crosslinks. So normally in healthy bone, you have a lot of good enzymatic crosslinks. That's what CTX is that are giving the collagen more strength. But what happens is, is um, with these AGEs building up, they make these bad non-enzymatic crosslinks. Um, which make the bone more brittle and stiff and less flexible and tough. And because there's more of these bad crosslinks, so there's less room for the good crosslinks, mm -hmm. like CTX. So nobody really knows, but I just wanted to make the point that if a diabetic patient has a low CTX, it could be just because they have low bone resorption, and that's probably part of it. But it might just be that they're not having as many of those crosslinks. So you might use a different test, like something called TRAP is an assay that actually measures osteoclast activity that might be a more accurate reflection of bone resorption in the diabetic state. In our bone biopsies that we did, we didn't see that bone resorption was decreased the same way bone formation was, but we really only did it in five diabetics and five healthy people, so we don't really know from that. The main point is just that bone formation is definitely slowed down in the diabetics and bone resorption maybe is, and of course there's coupling, but we just don't know that as well for sure. That was the main point I wanted to get across. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you guys. Thank you.